Welcome to Lifeline Baptist Church Sunday evening Bible study. Tonight we'll continue our class on the introduction to the New Testament. And I'm still uh, into biblical backgrounds. And if I take you as far into my lesson material tonight as I hope, um, you, will, you will cover some early part of the New Testament and late altogether. If you'll remember last week, we talked about Jesus' cleansing of the tem uh, temple in the second chapter of John, and this is in the beginning of the New Testament. I will call this the appearance of Christianity as we know it in Jesus at the temple for the first time. And what I propose to do tonight, if, uh, if I can speed up what I'm talking about, we'll cover the first instance of Jesus going to the temple and stating what he's all about. And then we will have the last event that's recorded in the New Testament, and that is Paul's visit to the temple and what happened to Paul. And this is the second chapter of John, which I read you last week, about the time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And it says that he found in the temple courts people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables and to those who sold doves, he said, get those out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And John tattletales on, his, on Jesus' disciples about what they remembered. And most of the time, John will add that after the resurrection, they were reminded of what he said. This time it says his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Well, here is a you of the temple and uh, and you will remember from the last time that we went into this that there are the temple courts and this floor do you see that big area in there that's the court of the Gentiles and that's where it is thought that the money changing was going on in other words the Gentiles were forbidden to go into the holy place, but they could come into the temple, into the court of the Gentiles. And the, the temple was divided into various courts. And when a court had a name, that meant that those that that name applied to could not go further from that court. The first court was the court of the Gentiles. And they couldn't go past that. Then was the court of the women. And they couldn't go past that. Then there's a court of Israel. And those who were bar mitzvah, the, the, the men of Israel, they could go to that court. But could not go further. And then there was a court of the priests. And only the priests could go in there. And so forth. Probably... Do you see where my cursor is over here on, on your left? The south, that's the south end of the temple where that red roof building is. That's called the royal porch. And there's a dispute whether that was completed by the time that Jesus was there. But that royal porch was supposed to have a synagogue in it. And it's supposed to be where the scholars met and had their discussions and the Sanhedrin and so forth. And you see these two objects there on the floor. Those are stairwells coming up from outside on the ground below the temple. And so they, the people could come up those steps and come out right here onto the court of the Gentiles. And they have discovered other entrances on this wall over here behind that, port, that porch right there. And Solomon's portico, they say, is over here on this, this the east side, the Mount of Olives side, where Jesus taught, uh, hopefully, in the shade.
Here's a view from the air of that Temple Mount today. And you see where that large building is, where my cursor is, that's the El Aqsa Mosque. And uh, that's where the trouble started recently when the Palestinians uh, started raining missiles down on Israel. Well, the trouble started at the El Aqsa Mosque and Israeli police went in there and, and they say they're not supposed to. This, the, the, what is sacred about that to the Muslims is that that is where Mohammed mounted his winged horse and flew off to heaven from that mosque right there. You see that. And then this other mosque is the Dome of the Rock and that of course is where the temple stood and it stood on the place supposedly where Abraham offered up his son. The Jews say that son was Isaac. The Muslims say that son was his firstborn Ishmael. And so you have a dispute there that will continue till the end of time, I suppose. Now, I've showed you that to call attention to this building you see here on the, on the right and where I'm moving my cursor. I'm gonna show you this better. But that is the site of Fortress Antonia. And there was, a, there was a fortress there long before Herod, but Herod put a real fort there. And so I'm going to, I'm going to get into that. Here's the wall of separation. You see my cursor there? You see these buildings inside. You had to climb steps to go from one to the other of these courts. Remember I showed you the front steps coming up down here under the royal courts or the royal store. That puts you on the court of the Gentiles. There's a sign on this little wall right here that warned the Gentiles that if you go past this sign, it'll be your fault if you're dead, more or less, We'll be innocent of your death. You caused it, you're dead, it's your fault. So the Gentiles could not go up these steps and into the court of the women. The court of the women is, is in here with four buildings. Can you see that there are four buildings inside there? Two of these, they say, and archeologists have argued about lots of such things for a long time, but two of these are the treasury. And you remember that Jesus stood by the treasury and observed that some cast in much. And you read about them sounding the trumpet. Well, the, the trumpet was a kettle drum shaped thing made out of brass. And when you poured your coins in there, if there were a lot of them, it would rattle the trumpet and you would sound the trumpet as it rattled going down. And Jesus watched a woman put in two mites, which I'm sure made no noise. And he said, she's put in more than they all. Well, that happened in the court of the women right there. Can you see that there are steps where my cursor is? That leads up to that door. And that door is uh, the entrance to the court of the priest. And, and this is the court of Israel, those steps really. And the, and the men can carry their sacrifice up those steps. And, and the priest will accept them at the top of the steps. The court of the priest is on the other side. And nobody can go in there but the priest. And so they hand their sacrifices to them. They prepare them. And they burn them on the altar which is inside. This is the thing that they have found, the sign that was on that wall I told you about. This is the inscription that they found at the temple. If you'll notice down there at the bottom, it says uh, Constantinople. That's in a museum in Constantinople. And that is a, an inscription that the Greeks could read. And that's the one that warns them and this is the translation. No foreigner may enter within the balustrade around the sanctuary and the enclosure. Whoever is caught 
on himself shall he put the blame for the death which will ensue. I think this is me now. I didn't get this necessarily out of the Bible, but I think that one thing that offended Jesus was not only that they had turned the temple, that the people came from all over the known world to worship God, and they turned it into a place of, of them making money with cattle and, and birds and money changing and so forth, but it was in the court of the Gentiles. I was asked in my Sunday school class this morning, what is the significance of the splitting of the curtain in front of the altar when, when Jesus died? And I believe that it, what that curtain meant it was that it excluded everybody but the high priest from the Holy of Holies, which they believed was the seat of God. They believed that God actually resided, or at least his spirit, in that room. And that's why only the high priest could go in there and only once a year. And I'm told that when he went in there, they had to tie a rope around his ankle because if God killed him in there, nobody could go get him. So they, they fixed it where they could pull him out. Well, <clears throat> when that curtain was split, the whole world could see it and have access to it. I think that's I, I, my opinion. Anybody got a different one here? This is the picture of the Dome of the Rock as it exists today. Uh, I'll go back. Do you see that tower up there? This is a picture of the Mount of Olives, and I just thought I'd throw this in for you so that to help you locate things. That is a church up there that is approximately on the place of the home of Simon the leper. Bethany is right behind it, the home of uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And that is the site where the New Testament says that Jesus was anointed for his burial. When I was uh, studying there, I was taken to Caesarea Philippi, and I was taught that when Peter was asked by Jesus, who do you say the Son of Man is? And he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. I was taught that that meant that Peter was the first believing Christian. I don't believe that. And I'll tell you why. John says that they did not believe in Jesus' resurrection till they saw the empty tomb. Peter is the one, the very one, who told Jesus, you will not die. And what did Jesus say to that man? Nothing has it. Jesus never said anything to anybody else like he said to Peter. He said, get behind me, who? Satan. That's rough. And I don't think Jesus talked like that to the first believer on the face of this earth. I actually believe, and this is not necessarily in the Bible, but I just happen to believe this, that Jesus, I mean, you, you read in the New Testament that they tried to kill him, but his time had not come. You remember all that? And it, and it, and it kept happening. His time had not come. And then you read a text that some Greeks showed up and said, we would see Jesus. And Jesus then said, the time has come. Wow. Wow. The gospel is for the Greeks also from Jesus. And I say that the time could not come until somebody believed in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection. And that woman who anointed him for his burial, name is Mary. There's a dispute about which Mary it is. That one is the first one, in my opinion. And his time could not come until somebody believed that. <coughs> that 
church up there commemorates the spot. This one down here, do you see that one? That is a tear-shaped church commemorating the spot where Jesus wept over Jerusalem. There's a close-up of it. Do you see the, there's a iron grill front on that? Y'all Can y'all see that well enough to take that out? All right, this left-hand picture here is a picture I made through there, through that grill. And in there, that grill is full of Christian symbolism. As I look at that picture, do you see a cross over the Temple Mount? and the Dome of the Rock. Do you see the thorns, the crown of thorns there? Do you see a cup there representing the blood? Do you see, I'm about to lose my cursor, 12 spaces there, the 12 disciples, the 12 tribes of Israel and so forth. Quite a bit of symbolism where Jesus wept. And this plaque over here on the right in the floor, can y'all tell that that's a, that's a uh, marble plaque? That's been there since the Crusades. That is a Byzantine altar place that's been there, who knows, a thousand years? This is the El Aqsa Mosque from the air. This is the south end of the temple. And this is where the royal porch or the royal stoa was. And that building went all the way across the temple mount. Do you see my cursor moving? That building went all the way across. This is a huge mosque, but it's not that big. Here's the side of it. And you see the temple wall. Those foundation stones that we looked at last week are down below that Herod put there. And all of this construction up here has been done in the last thousand years. And none of that was there in Jesus' time. Remember that the Romans level that platform. I'll show you one thing. The Jewish worshipers are on the left there behind that. That's the wailing wall over there. And this right here belongs to the Muslims. And there are excavations down there that have not been filled in. And I caught them looking the other way one day, and I went down to the bottom of one of those things, and I found some interesting stuff, which I'll tell you later. This is the front door of the mosque, the El Aqsa Mosque today. And these objects you see are relics brought up from below that the Romans dumped over the wall. And there is my class and on our trip to the mosque. And uh, I'll just show you some things. You see that blue robe right there? The women were required to wear those inside. You see some of the women have those. Uh, there's Mary Ann Ward, Professor Ward's wife. She's not wearing hers and Molly Marshall's not wearing hers. And uh, by the way, that's Douglas Green right there. He's a medical doctor and he came with us because he and Molly, well, they were married after this trip at some point. So you can know that what, what he, the reason he's there is not necessarily the doctor on the rest of us. This arm you see right there is Professor Ward telling us about what went on that I'm passing on to you tonight. But you can see the size of that. And here is a picture that was taken inside of, of the worship 
that goes on inside. And here's the royal stoa as, as it probably existed in Christ's day. And remember I told you about the pinnacle of the temple? Well, this corner overlooks the Kidron Valley, and that's probably the place where Satan took Jesus to tempt him to jump. And see, you see the, the temple standing back there in the background? Now we come to Fortress Antonia. Now this is on the model, and they have recreated it as best they know how. It's also known, I think uh, Josephus called it the Tower of Antonia. Uh, Herod built that and named it after Mark Antony, his friend. And so it's Fortress Antonia. And the entrance to the temple through the fort is where my cursor is down here somewhere. And I'm going to show you what that means. This is another view of it. On the model. And you can see the fortress is outside the wall but has a connection to the wall. And you see the temple over there. And this is looking, this is down south. The temple is south of the fort. And then the royal stoa is south of that. And that's the whole temple mount in there. That picture jumps over. But this is the size of that fort. And I want you to understand that there's a lot of Roman soldiers in there to keep the peace at that temple. Now, I've come to Paul at Jerusalem. I've gotten away now from uh, the time of Jesus, the first trip of Jesus to the temple as a rabbi, as a teacher. And so now Paul has come. And this is after his missionary journeys. And he's come to Jerusalem because he says that the Lord has required that he come. And so he went through a, uh, he, he signed up for their purification uh, system, which lasted for several days. And it says uh, that when, and Paul had to go to the temple every day for seven days and be purified and go through the ceremonies. And when the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Well, you can know that these are guys who not only saw him, they recognized him and they even knew him and they probably had heard him speak. And they stirred up the whole crowd and seized him shouting, fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. And it says, they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Now remember, Paul could bring him into the court of the Gentiles, but he could not bring him in past that wall of separation into the court of the women or the court of Israel. The whole city was aroused. How do you think they did that? Do you think that they plotted and or, had a meeting and organized that and appointed people to go out and, and, uh, and arouse the, the people out there that could be aroused and they have met at an appointed time and arranged this thing? It looks like to me that the people, it says the whole city was aroused. Well, looks like to me that was pretty organized. They came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. Well, this I don't think this means, I know it doesn't mean that he was taken off of the temple mount. It means that they took him outside that wall into the court of the Gentiles, and I'll show you why. The fortress is on the northwest corner. And any soldiers coming out of that fortress had to have an entrance right down here where my cursor is. All right. Where Paul would have been is in here in the court of Israel. 
and they took him out of there and, and took everybody out of there and shut the gates. And so the, the proper place for a riot is out here on the court of the Gentiles. Y'all got that? <laughs> Where do you have your right? Not in the temple. While, now I'm, I've got the scripture, if you want to follow this in your Bible, it's Acts 21, verse 31. While they were trying to kill him, the commander of the Roman regiment received a report that all Jerusalem was in turmoil. Immediately he took some soldiers and centurions and ran down to the crowd. When the people saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. The commander came up and arrested Paul, ordering that he be bound with two chains. Then he asked who he was and what he had done. Well, the, the writer of Acts, Luke, I believe, didn't call him commander as we think of it. The word is that he was a chili archon. Well, what does that mean? We all know what an arch is, and an archon is the man that's the top soldier, top of the arch. And so what does chili mean? It means thousand. This is a man who commands a thousand soldiers in the Roman army. This is not some small man with small command. This, this is a big shot in the Roman army. This is probably a military tribune, which is the next thing to a real legion commander. There were 10 military tribunes in any Roman legion and uh, they commanded 600, a cohort of 600. Well, this man is a commander of a thousand, so they may have had more than a cohort in Fortress Atonia because nobody trusted the Jews to keep the peace. So the commander of the regiment, well, that the word is cohort, May have been more than that. 600 men is a cohort. <laughs> a cohort, by the way, has six centurions in it. And so he received a report about the turmoil. And immediately he took some soldiers and centurions and ran down to the crowd. And when the people saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. That's, <laughs> that, I guarantee you, there are some people that when they appear on the scene, there's going to be silence. And this man could make peace among the Jews. All he had to do was just step out there. And of course, he was not alone. And so he arrested Paul in order that he be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. Now there's the fort. And there's a, another view and, and this, remember that the riot is going out here on, on the court of the Gentiles and the soldiers are noticed that the commander heard that there was a riot and he could put two centurions and their troops out there on that floor in, in, in time to save Paul. Is that a quick response? They were ready. So here they come out of the fort out, on, out there onto the floor. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, now this is called barracks here, we're talking about Fortress Antonia, he asked the commander, may I say something to you? Do you speak Greek? This is the commander replied. He's astounded that Paul can speak Greek. He was not expecting that. That wasn't Aren't the, uh, that was not a, a trumpet there, so it's not the end of time. Yeah. Are we back on? Back on. <clears throat> All right. The commander asked him, do you speak Greek? And he replied about the Egyptian who started a revolt. And Paul answered, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. Please let me speak to the people. After receiving, well, I've turned too quick. After receiving the commander's permission, Paul stood on the steps. Now, 
the scripture says that there were steps off of the court of the Gentiles into the fort. Now I'm fixing to show you a picture of what's there today is why I'm going into detail about this. Paul motioned to the crowd, and when they were silent, he said to them in Aramaic, oh, oh, how many languages can Paul speak? Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. And when they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. They probably had it in their mind that all these charges against him from these Grecian Jews who probably couldn't speak Aramaic, that Paul is not one of them. And then when he speaks in Aramaic, uh-oh, this man is speaking our language. By the way, this is the language that Jesus spoke. It's the language of the exile. It is not Hebrew. So they became very quiet. Then Paul gave them this message, and I'm not going to read this whole message. I, you'll have to read this in your New Testament. It's uh, Acts 22. Paul said, I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. Brought, he was brought up in Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel. They knew exactly who Gamaliel was and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today, and I persecuted the followers of this way. You find that an interesting description of Christianity? This way, to their death, arrested men and women, throwing them into prison. Well, that's pretty zealous. And so he talks about his Damascus experience. And so I'm going to skip now to verse 19, at the end of the message that he gave. Lord, I replied, these people know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval, guarding the clothes of those who were there killing him. And then the Lord said to me, Go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. And then they raised their voices and shouted, Rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. And here's how stirred up they were acts 22 23 as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air the commander ordered that paul be taken into the barracks and he directed that he be flogged and interrogated in order to find out why the people were shouting at him like this as they stretched him out to flog him paul said to the centurion standing there is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? Has anyone ever told y'all the penalty for claiming you were a Roman citizen if you weren't? Or the penalty for flogging a Roman citizen who hasn't been found guilty? The Romans were really good at the death penalty. That's how they got rid of Jesus. That's how Jesus' accusers got rid of Jesus, they thought. But you couldn't flog a Roman citizen unless he were found guilty. And you could have the death penalty. Let's see how the Roman army reacted to this. When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do? This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a lot of money for my citizenship, but I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Well, in other words, Paul had more of a right to being a citizen than that commander. Those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. I'm reminded of a story that I heard last week at World Changers. Our friend Jimmy Red was here, and he told me about an incident that happened to him in Vietnam, and that is the soldiers were assembled for a change of command ceremony, 
and the officers were up on the stage and all the soldiers had been called from their posts and were standing out there at ease while the speeches were being made. Now, all of these men had been under fire. Mortar fire had been coming in on them. They had to dive for their foxhole every time an explosion came off. And so the moment came in the ceremony when they fired a piece of artillery right behind the stage. And all those soldiers disappeared from the face of this earth. All of them went to their foxhole right then. That's exactly what happened when these soldiers found out that they had put a man in chains and were about to beat him. And this man was a Roman citizen. And they found it out. It says, they, those who were about to interrogate him withdrew immediately. I mean, they vanished. The commander himself was alarmed. You couldn't be a general and get away with that either. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. So here is a story that I find very moving. There are people in the Bible that we don't think about very much. They went, I, I've skipped some verses here. I'm at chapter 23, verse 14. They formed a plot against Paul and the plotters went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more in accurate information about his case. We're ready to kill him before he gets there or gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand. How old is this young man? Who do you take by the hand? A little fellow, right? This, consider what you have here about Paul's family, his sister's son. He took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? Well, I, I just threw in this picture right here there is a triumphal arch in Rome and there are some carvings on it that picture Roman soldiers. These are the guys that ran out there with the commander. Of course, these are, are Caesar's personal bodyguard, but uh, it, it is Roman soldiers and they've got their arms and so forth. And you see those uh, headdress, a centurion, had that twice and the way it worked was that they had their headdress forward and backwards the centurion had one going out each side everybody on the battlefield knew who the centurions were if you were a centurion in the Roman army you had to stand your ground and everybody on the battlefield was after you I mean a centurion wasn't just nobody and these are the guys that silenced the crowd but they're also the guys that when they found out that they had bound a Roman citizen these are the guys who hid in their foxholes is that accurate to say the little boy said don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are awaiting an ambush for him they have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they kill him. And they are ready now waiting for your consent to their request. 
And the commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. And then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers. Well, these are all soldiers. This is infantry, 200 infantry, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Well, all of these, the 400 are all a form of infantry, and then the 70 cavalry. And notice, this commander had enough of these soldiers it says here, provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. You didn't know that Paul rode horses either, did you? This commander had enough soldiers to send off nearly 500 of them with Paul and still had enough soldiers to guard the temple against a riot. Maybe he did have a thousand men in there. He might have even had more. So Paul now is being sent to Governor Felix and this is the end of Paul's freedom to do missionary work except as a prisoner. You have the prison epistles that Paul wrote from prison and so forth. And this that I have talked to you about today that happened at the temple is the beginning of Paul the prisoner. And I, and I thought I would just bring this up about the letter. This will tell you something about politics and it will tell you something about the Roman army politics. Acts 23, verse 25, he wrote the letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, and he is mentioned by name in here more than once. Claudius Lysias to his excellency, Governor Felix. And incidentally, Felix was the governor un until, if I read the history right, till the year 59 BC. So you can know that this is in the late 50s when this is going on. And so this is going to Governor Felix. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. Did he leave something out of that? He made it sound like that he found out he was a Roman citizen and rescued him. What happened was that he rescued him and put him in chains and was about to beat him half to death and him an uncondemned Roman citizen. Well, he left that out. That's interesting. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. Well, again, he left it out that he ordered the troops to flog him and torture him and get and to, and to question him. So he, there was a meeting of the Sanhedrin, and, and that's where Paul told the Sanhedrin about his... Damascus experience and then they stopped him when he got down there to the point where and God told me to go to the Gentiles. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So Claudius Lysias has turned on Paul's side because he's a Roman citizen and so he's sending him down to Caesarea and all these Jews that are so zealous for the law and willing to kill a man to uphold their law, they're going to have to go down to Caesarea and bring charges against the man. Now here is the picture I told you I'd show you. That is the stone ground that they cut when they built the temple, Mount Moriah is, is on a slant downhill. And up on the upper end, they cut down into the rock to, have to start the platform. And then as, it, as, it, as the mountain went downhill, the platform leveled out and that's where all that high, like at the pinnacle of the temple, how high it was on the other end it's not only on the ground, it's actually below the ground. And this stonework, you, uh, it's not stonework, but it's raw stone, is where they dug into the ground on the north end of the temple and Fortress Antonia was there where that wall is, you see. That wall is not near 
anything like what Antonia was. And you see that there was a hole cut there that's been walled up and only a doorway now. That probably is where those sta that stairway went that went into Antonia where those soldiers came out. That probably is the best candidate for where those soldiers came out onto the temple floor. And this is another shot of it. You see that that's rock right there that's been hewn. They dug in here. And this was the original floor of the temple on the ground. So I've given you two events in the temple. The kingdom of God as proclaimed by Jesus Christ at the temple, the rejection at the temple, and, then, and this is the first event and the last one. In John 2, it happened in the late 20th AD. Jesus goes to the temple. You have the cleansing and the demand. The Jews demanded, what sign will you give us that you can get away with this? And so this is the beginning of Jesus' temple, uh, teaching in the temple. And I'm going to show you the text about Jesus rejecting the beliefs of those professing to believe at the temple. And then in Acts 21, 22, and 23, in the late 50s, Paul goes to the temple. And Paul is accused by the Grecian Jews of, of taking Gentiles into the holy place. And Paul is arrested in the temple. And Paul is saved by the Roman commander of the fort. And Paul's freedom as a minister of the gospel ends at the temple. And you see it, I put in large print, both events at the temple, the beginning and the end of it. So in John 2.18, the Jews demand a sign. The Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, it took 46 years to build this temple. Will you raise it up in three days? We had the question asked last week about exactly how many years. It says here 46 years and I understand that it was not really finished even then. And you will raise it up in three days, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. And now John tells the truth. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. In John's gospel, we find that, uh, that he enumerated seven signs. Well, actually, this text right here gives you the idea that he did a lot of signs. Remember that John said, if we had told you everything that Jesus did, I suppose the whole world wouldn't hold the books. Well, the seven signs in John are a message that the, the important signs, number seven, but he did many signs. While he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus did not entrust himself to them, for he knew them all. He did not need any testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Y'all find that curious? No questions about that. Well, I'll ask you one. What is a sign? When you come on the freeway out here to a sign that says Little Rock, as you look at that sign, are you looking at Little Rock? So what is the sign? It's not Little Rock. It tells you how to get there. It points you to where you're going and lets you know where you are. And these signs that Jesus did pointed to something. And it also, if they paid attention, it told them where they were. 
And, it, and this says that they saw those signs and believed in his name, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man. Well, what did they believe? Why did he not entrust himself to them? What was their belief? Their belief was their version of the Messiah. Their version of the Messiah has to do with being able to rule the world in God's name and under God's power. They wanted a guy that would do that. They wanted a guy that would fight the Romans and kill all those sinners. They weren't sinners. They were Mar Mitzvah. John the Baptist tried to tell them, you better repent. And Jesus told them, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish like those people that that tower fell on. Well, they, when he fed the 5,000, do you remember that John told you that they tried to make him a king by force? Jesus rejected the kingdom of God coming by force. Well, Jesus did not entrust himself to them and ultimately they didn't trust Jesus either because they found out he wasn't going to use force. Peter told him, you're not going to die, we'll fight for you. And he had a sword and he used it. And Jesus said, nope, we don't do it that way. They wanted a winner. And Jesus was willing to die. And they thought that was a loser. Well, I, here's the way I tell it. They got their Messiah. And it wasn't what they expected. It wasn't what they believed. And it wasn't what they wanted. They wanted a different kind. So they sent him back to God, dead, and said, we don't like this one. Try again. And they got another one, fresh out of the grave. John sent that same one back, and this time he's alive, and they're not going to get rid of it. And what they've got today is you and the church. And we don't kill people if they don't agree with us. We try to win them of their own free word and accord. We don't profess Jesus because he's promised to conquer the world. We profess Jesus because he's promised to conquer our sin and save us from that death that sin causes us to be owed. So, those who believed there that Jesus wouldn't entrust him to, I'll ask you a question and don't answer it, but they, it says they believe. Were they saved? Well, I can tell you that we tell people sometimes that they're saved and they haven't believed. When you believe, you have been changed forever. You have turned from doing whatever you want to do in the life of sin, and you have tried to obey the commands of Jesus in your life. That's a change. And just saying, oh, I believe the story. The story is a thing. The story is the facts. And facts are things. And belief is and things won't save you. Jesus said, whoever believes in him. He didn't say whoever believes the story about him. Faith is the same as belief, and yet it's different. But it, both of them are action. The Berean Study Bible translate James 1.22 be doers of the word, not hearers only. Otherwise, you're deceiving yourselves. The Berean Liberal Bible says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And the King James, which we all memorize this one, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Y'all ever sing that song when you, were, when you were a little kid? Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only and you deceive yourself about your salvation if you can't be a doer of the word. What is belief? Belief biblically means more than simple thinking or mere words. Your believing identifies you. It shows who you are. 
If you're a believer, it'll show and and it'll it, it, it'll it'll be a form of a witness, and the Holy Spirit will be there, and God will find a way to use it. I don't care who you are. When you are a believer, God is in you, and He'll use you some way. It'll come out in your thinking, your acting, your working, and you'll be serving in the way you live. The word is pesteon. And it doesn't really mean your form of thinking. The idea is firmness, reliability, steadfastness. You know, we have a doctrine, once saved, always saved. Well, that needs some, some uh, discussion. What it means is that when you're saved, you're going to be firm about your salvation and how you stand. It means that God can rely on you. It means that you are steadfast in your faith. And if you're not that, you better look out. Believing is the state of a person's being. It's who you are or who you are not. Belief is a verb. Faith is a noun. That's the difference in the two words. But they're, they're really the same thing. They are both intellectual belief, thinking, but they're also trusting God and your commitment. That's why we're talking about firmness, reliability, and steadfastness. True belief and faith are that God is real God. He's your God. And Jesus, God the Son, is your Lord. I've said here before, if you can't say Jesus is Lord, you better look out. If Jesus is just a story to you, he's not your Lord. Jesus said, for us to teach whatsoever I have commanded you. True faith and belief are trustworthiness in your life, acting out salvation in life. And I'll start here next week. The Lord willing, we'll come back. Thank you for being here. May we pray. Our Father, teach us your word. Teach us your way. Teach us how to live out our belief and our faith. Teach us to be trustworthy and faithful. We ask a blessing upon your people this day, wherever they are in this world, especially those that are being persecuted, their children persecuted, their families destroyed, and even people even being killed. We ask that you be with your people this day, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.